Nadaljujemo z našo zadnjo, pravzaprav temo, ki bo pa potem pikana i tudi celotni konferenci. Ne upozorim, da se to predavanje snima, zato ker je tako dovolj tudi predavatelj, tudi želev si je in da vsi, ki boste, ki možda niste prisotni, da boste dobili posnetek tudi kasneje. O čem bomo govorili v tem zadnjem predavanju oziroma pogovoru? Govorili bomo o sanjah vsakega kadrovika, bi lahko rekla. Kako lahko torej kadrovska funkcija postane del vseh zaposlenih ali pa kadrovska funkcija v vsakem zaposlenem? Z nami bo v bistvu zelo priznan predavatelj oziroma govornik Jonathan Westover iz Human Capital Innovation in sicer v bistvu je Jonathan zelo izkušen svetovalec za organizacijsko vodanje, upravljanje ljudi in organizacijski razvoj. Prihaja iz ZDA, hkrati pa ima tudi številne, številne izkušnje tudi v bistvu evropskih podjetjih, predvsem je veliko delo tudi na zahodu in na vzhodu. Oboje ima tako, da ima tako medkulturno, bom rekla, znanje. Hkrati je tudi raziskovalec in je naredil kar nekaj zanimivih raziskav ravno na kadrovskem področju. In zato smo ga tudi izbrali, da bomo z njim torej povedali nekaj več, ako lahko kadrovska funkcija zaživi v vsakem zaposlenem. So, dear John, I have already introduced you in Slovenian language. I'm sure you understand everything. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Okay, thank you very much and welcome to, to our audience. So, let me uh, just mention, uh, 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 introduce a little bit more about the context for all our also foreign, maybe, audience who are attendees. So, the HR functions, uh, function is... Uh, one, in my opinion, one of the most responsible roles in today's agile businesses. But however, uh, human resource managers are also one of the employees. So within day-to-day -day obligations and tasks, many of the HR functions get lost between daily, you know, administration tasks, and uh, often uh, they have no time to deal with large numbers of, uh, let's say, um, employees and of course to take care for personal approach to their development and more and more employees uh, skills and competences are in the the head of today hr world so we must uh, we already heard today in the conference that we will must uh, uh, reinvent ourselves regarding the competences <laughs> and skills and yes this is uh, quite uh, quite a big issue but however uh, how how can we address uh, uh, this topic uh, uh, on how to support HR role vertically and horizontally throughout the company and how each of and every employees can become an extended HR right-hand person. So <laughs> let's uh, maybe uh, introduce you first a little bit more and then I, I will ask you some questions, okay? Perfect, perfect. Well, again, thank you so much for the invitation to join you today. It's dark and early in the morning for me here. I'm in south of Salt Lake City in Utah, 6 a.m. here, uh, late afternoon for you, I believe, in Slovenia. It's, it's, it's a fantastic privilege to be with all of you. And while I was listening in on the last session, of course, I, I don't speak your language, and so I couldn't fully understand uh, what was being said, but every now and then there are words that have close proximity. I'm like, oh, okay, they're, they're talking about that. Um, I'll just give a really quick additional uh, introduction to myself. And I I am a, a full-time professor. I teach, organ I'm in the organizational leadership department at Utah Valley University in Utah. I'm chair of the department as well as a professor, and I teach human resource management courses, organization organizational development and change management courses, uh, workplace ethical decision-making, leadership, those types of courses. And I've been doing that since receiving my PhD, and I've been a professor for about 13 years. In addition, as was mentioned, I'm the managing partner and principal at Human Capital Innovations, a firm that I co-founded back in 2007. And uh, we do a lot of organizational assessment work for organizations, uh, but also consulting work, executive and leadership development work, and uh, those types of things. I have a family of eight. So I've, I, I've been married for 20 years and I have six children wow. and uh, they're, they're a pleasure. 
And uh, yeah, so that's, that's me in a nutshell. I am super passionate about HR. I'm super passionate about the future of work and how we can prepare ourselves for that future. And all of my academic research, all of my practitioner-oriented research and publications, they all focus on these questions that you just mentioned. They all focus on how can we truly integrate HR functions across the organization so that we can create systems, sustainable systems, policies, practices, and procedures that will allow us to maximize the human potential within our organizations and within our teams. And that can only happen as we distribute the HR responsibilities across the organization to the point where every manager from the lowest level supervisor who may only supervise two or three people all the way up through the senior executive level and the C-suite to the CEO, that every leader recognize their role in people management and human resources, that they take on that responsibility and they recognize the, the, the crucial essential components that will drive meaningful and safe dynamic cultures within organizations so that people can thrive. So I, I do a lot of research in the areas of employee engagement, worker satisfaction, job quality, uh, employee motivation, those sorts of, of areas and outcomes. And the research couldn't be more clear. When you have highly engaged people, satisfied workers, when, you, when they're motivated and they, they have the ability to do what they do best each and every day in a psychologically safe and inclusive environment, they produce better. They produce more. Uh, and there's better outcomes for the org for them personally, but for the organizations and for the consumer. That's what we all want. Um, so there's a clear business case for stronger HR. I don't need to convince all of you of that. And there's a clear human case for stronger HR, and we need to do it together. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Jonathan, um, today we are talking uh, mostly about competences and skills. So uh, I'm really wonder, in your opinion, is there any difference for the developing skill and competences from an individual point of view and of an employee's in a working environment? What do you think about it? Yeah, it's, it's a really important question because the nature of work is shifting so rapidly. Now, of course, we, we've seen evidence of that uh, and we've had a perfect case study over these last two years of a global pandemic during COVID where we've seen ourselves accelerated into the shifting nature of work, disruptive technologies, the use of things like Zoom for remote work. All of these things I'm sure have been discussed throughout this conference uh, uh, today. Because of the, the rapid pace of change, there's never been a more important time for us to continually reskill and upskill ourselves and our teams so that everyone has the competencies and capabilities necessary to function effectively in the future of work. And in the ideal world, I would say every organization and every leader needs to own the responsibility to make sure that they're identifying gaps in skills and competencies with, within their team, that they're helping their people set goals, that they're creating a learning plan with each of their people on their team, and that together with the support of the organization, the development opportunities are provided so that all, everyone within our organization has the chance to learn continually, develop continually, and develop those new skills that are necessary, those competencies and capabilities that will help them be successful. That's in an ideal world. We don't live in an ideal world. And obviously, not every organization has that same level of commitment. Not every leader has that same level of commitment. Um, so in addition to there being an organizational necessity for a constant focus on competencies and capabilities and, and reskilling and upskilling, each of us has to take on that personal responsibility uh, for our own careers and, and in supporting our own colleagues. We can't necessarily count on that 
the, the level of support that we should get from our organization. So I, I do want to say that. I think we need to be our own advocates. We need to be our own, like the CEO of our own career. We have to take responsibility for that. And if we can do that, then uh, we're going to have a better chance of, of sustainably moving forward in a positive direction. Can I now, let me, challenge you? Oh, yeah, yeah go, go ahead, go ahead. Can I challenge you with, with uh, uh, additional question? So we'd like sure. to, yes, in, in working environment, we uh, really like to share responsibilities, <laughs> but in, not also in the wrong way. So I'm very interesting. What is your opinion uh, about the uh, development of skills and competences regarding the responsibilities? Who is really responsible for the development of uh, competences, employee competences, let's say, and to what extent? Okay, is this leader? Is organization? It's a society? Who? <laughs> yeah, it, it's a great question, and honestly, everyone is responsible. Uh, absolutely, and what I was trying to get at in my last response was for anyone listening and for anyone on your teams. You know, I, I want to convey the message that we need to take ownership over our own development because we can't necessarily count on others in the organization doing it for us or, or really pushing that for us. That, that's the reality that we live in, that we have, to, we have to take ownership over our own development, our own careers. That said, absolutely, I am a believer that every single leader within an organization, regardless of whether they have HR in their job title or not, every single leader in an organization has core responsibility for the development of the people on their team. Now, again, this, this, it doesn't matter if we're talking about the CEO or a senior executive, a senior director, anywhere you know, down through the hierarchy. It doesn't matter where you're at. You could be the lowest level supervisor with only responsibility for a very small specialized team. Um, regardless, wherever you happen to be at in your leadership role, you have a responsibility to develop your people and to help them understand the necessary competencies, not just for today, but for the future. Um, and that's, in, in my mind, that's one of the biggest pieces of what good leadership is. If I'm a strong leader, then I'm focused on the development of my people. If I'm a strong leader, my goal is to help everyone around me recognize and then grow into their potential. And that only happens as we adopt a growth mindset, an abundance mindset, and as we as we become continual lifelong learners. So if I have that approach as a leader, regardless of where I'm at in the organization, then I can recognize um, that that's going to be part of my daily existence. Every day, I'm in my in my casual conversations with my people, in my formal one on ones and performance reviews. Uh, with my people, every opportunity I get, I should be focusing on how can I develop my people. Now, of course, HR, you know, organizationally, if we take a step back, HR often has responsibility for broader organizational initiatives. So you may have some sort of an executive leadership development program, for example, that's not uncommon in many large organizations. And that's good. I think, I think, that HR can take responsibility for some of these organization-wide formal learning uh, experiences and, and development experiences. Um, but they can't and they shouldn't be responsible for members of your team uh, because they're, they're disconnected. The only people that truly know your team are members of your team and the leader of the team. And so they have to take the responsibility first and foremost. Okay, great. Uh, Jonathan, you mentioned grow mindset. Uh, it's very interesting because uh, this concept is really, um, it's perfect for me uh, <laughs> regarding the HR. Uh, but however, how many uh, leaders you think are in this grow mindset and how many tend to be fixed mindset? That That is the question of the day, isn't it? I think uh, adopting an abundance and growth mindset is an absolute necessity in today's economy, in today's labor market, in today's world of work, 
it's going to be even more so in the future of work. And so are there people today that are in leadership roles, in some cases, extremely important senior leadership and executive roles that have a fixed mindset? Yes, there are. I, I've experienced them. I'm sure you've experienced them. Will they be in those roles in the future of work? I don't think so. I, I don't think they can be because organizations led by individuals with a fixed mindset simply are going to go extinct. <laughs> um, the, it, the, the fast pace of change, the constant disruption, and just the nature of the way things are moving constantly requires us to be more agile and agility requires us to learn. It requires us to experiment. It requires us to continually grow. And if we can't do that, we can't be effective as leaders. So you, if you go, if you look back over the last say 50 years of the global economy and the, the ebbs and flows and the shifts in the economic composition of the economy and the types of um, jobs that people pro predominantly did and such, you can see a clear trend um, away from kind of the traditional command control form of leadership in organizations with tall hierarchical structures, with more fixed mindset approach to how leaders lead, continually over time shifting more and more to the point where now what we, what we need today and what really drives success today um, is an empowerment leadership style, a transformational leadership style, a, a servant leadership style uh, that's focused on developing people and infusing organizations with growth mindset, abundance mindset, innovation culture, knowledge sharing, and all of these types of, of things. Um, there are relics, there are remnants of older com command control models of leadership and fixed mindset approaches to leadership um, in some organizations, but they're becoming fewer and fewer. And in 10 years, I, I just don't see how for most organizations, how they would even be able to survive uh, if they have leaders who who have a fixed mindset. So that that's one of the number one competencies and capabilities that we need to develop in ourselves and that we need to help every member of our team develop. Because remember, just because we're we're a leader of a team and we have people that report to us today, those same people that report to us today might be the senior executives of tomorrow. And we need to prepare them now with the right mindsets, with the, the right frameworks, with the right understanding of the world, with the competencies and capabilities necessary so that they are prepared for those future positions. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, grow mindset will be even more important. Can you imagine that the HR so. manager is in the fixed mindset? <laughs> so. I mean, you, you see examples of it. And, and there are times where I, where I encounter people who, who have a fixed mindset um but it's becoming more and more rare and it's it's just untenable it, it's not going to serve uh organizations well in the future okay thank you uh, however we all know that there is no size fits all in human resources especially yeah? what would you suggest to hr managers or hr specialists hr business partners and so on regarding the development of skills and competencies of course, of the employee in their uh, companies. Uh, do you suggest some common approach or do, do you can suggest some uh, different approach? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, good question. Again, like you said, there's not a one size fits all. So we can't take a completely generic approach to, de to the development of people. Uh, it's simply not possible. Now I, I say that as a professor. So I teach courses where, <laughs> you know, I have, 40 students in a class and they're all learning the same things. They're all taking the same, doing the same readings. They're all doing the same assignments, right? It's kind of a standard structured, consistent kind of a learning experience for my students in the university classroom. Is there a time and a place for those types of learning opportunities? Absolutely. So, so there are some forms of learning um, where we can standardize as much as possible we can streamline as much as possible, and there are, are efficiencies with that, um, and there's scalability with that. So there's a time and a place. But even within, like say, a traditional university course, 
like that I often teach. I have to know the needs of my students and I have to allow flexibility within the scaffolding and the structure of the way my course is designed and the assignments that are given that it can be personalized and individualized to each student because no two students are exactly the same. Students are not a monolith. They have different needs. They have different desires, different goals, different career trajectories. They have different life circumstances in personal and professional contexts. And because of that, if I can't create a structured learning environment where every individual person can get what they need from it, it's not going to be very effective. Okay. So that's, that's within more structured, formalized types of learning experiences within organizations. And, and we've seen organizations doing those for forever, right? You can have, you can have organization wide training and development programs across a whole range of different skill sets, competencies. Um, they can be leadership development. They can be skill development, customer service, whatever, right? Pick, pick your, your um, topic. You can do formal classroom based or online. Uh, forms of structured learning. And there's opportunities for that. What I would say, though, in, in relation to your question and some of the previous questions that we've been talking about today, is the even greater opportunity for continuous learning within organizations comes, I think, not through the structured programs that often come from a centralized HR or a training and development department, and then are distributed out throughout the organization. But it comes through the consistent coaching and mentorship that happens within teams. So again, it, as I was saying earlier, if I as if if every team within an organization is empowered to the point where each leader can can really support their people to the best extent possible, and they have resources, they have funding, they have um, the the resources necessary to do that. What you can do is then specialize uh, and, and, and really fine tune any sort of training approach to these very specific needs of your team, uh, or even better yet, the very specific needs of an individual employee. Uh, and that can happen in real time. As a leader, if I wake up every morning and I come to work and I know that one of my primary goals is to develop my people and help them become just a little bit better each and every day, uh, then I'm going to make sure that I'm having regular uh, conversations with them, formal and informal. I'm going to make sure that I'm having regular coaching opportunities with them, that I'm having mentorship opportunities, and that I'm helping them uh, learn continually. Uh, and, and that can apply to any range of skills, competencies, and capabilities within the organization or within my team. Okay, uh, good. Um, uh, can you tell me, are there any kind of universal competences and skills um, everyone should nurture and, and develop? You know, in uh, Europe, you have uh, some kind of forecast of uh, World Economic Forum. Actually, yeah. every five years, I think they, they made some, some research and they uh, make forecast uh, top 10 competencies will be desired in, let's say, 25, uh, 2025 now. OK, so I'm uh, looking also um, uh, for uh, in, in, in this place. Are there some kind of universal competencies we should all develop in the course working environment? So called yes. general competencies. Yeah. Yes, I, I think so. So one, one report that I've looked a lot at um, that you may or may not be familiar with, it's from the Institute for the Future, their Future Work Skills Report. Uh, they just came out with an updated report, uh, I think about a year ago. And I really like the way they frame it because they frame the, the context around the changing nature of work and the future of work, the drivers of change around that future, and, and then what are the competencies and capabilities necessary within that new context? So they identify um, some meta drivers of global change in the workplace. Uh, so for example, super structured organizations, these massive mm -hmm. organizations um, that are becoming more and more common 
uh, in the West, in back uh, in in the in Europe, in Asia, all over the world. And because of the nature of these superstructured organizations, um, it, it changes the dynamics of how we work. Uh, another global kind of driver of change is that we're in a continually and increasingly globally interconnected world. Um, because we have things like um, these technologies uh, for virtual meetings uh, and even moving into the, the metaverse in the future, uh, we can literally connect with anybody from anywhere in the world and work with them. This means organizations can have distributed teams, remote teams. Um, there's all sorts of possibilities related to this in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and, and ultimately, it completely changes what used to be geographically bound teams around, you know, living in, in a particular area, working together to now it, it's, it's global and we're increasingly interconnected. There's new media ecologies. There's new media uh, coming out all the time, new platforms, the rise of smart machines and systems, just the shifting demographics of the world. Uh, people are living longer. What does that mean for an aging workforce, et cetera? And we're in an increasingly computational world. And I've already mentioned a couple of times how you know the, the, the disruptive technological innovations are reshaping the way we do our work. Not, not just with, uh, with robots, machine, but deep machine learning, artificial intelligence, and, and so many other disruptive technologies. Okay, so that's the context. That's, that's all of these different major drivers shifting the, the nature of work. Now, within that context, we have to pay attention to what does every single employee within an organization need to be able to do in this new envisioned future? And, and again, we're kind of living it now. So we're, we're already partially in this future. It's going to continue to, to develop and change. We're going to continue to move forward into this future. Within this kind of context, though, we need to develop skills and competencies related to cognitive load management. That means we need people who can essentially keep a lot of balls in the air. So we talk about juggling. In, in, a, in a complex job, I need to be able to juggle a lot of things. I need to keep a lot of balls in the air. That's kind of the saying we, we say here in the US. Um, that essentially is cognitive load management. What is my mental bandwidth to be able to deal with complexity, to be able to deal with um, uncertainty and the messiness of my work life and the types of work that we're trying to accomplish in my team? If, if I can't expand my my uh, mental bandwidth as as it relates to the complexities and the interconnectedness of these different disparate parts of the work that I do and the teams in within the organization in in a, an increasingly complex world then I'm not going to be very effective my team's not going to be very effective and the organization's not going to to perform at capacity so cognitive load management is one that I'd say is very very important we also need increasing skills and competencies around virtual collaboration. Now that, that should be super clear and transparent, especially after two years of, of living within this global pandemic environment and people working largely remotely for a lot of that time. And even right now, as we're, inter, as we're connecting across the globe via Zoom, do we know how to do this effectively? Do we know how to engage people uh, effectively, like right now, we're having a conversation, but it is it is largely, um, you know, us talking at people. But there there are more and more ways that we can provide engaging virtual collaboration spaces and opportunities for people to learn and grow together, uh, even when they're distributed teams, even when they're scattered and and working from anywhere. Uh, and so we need to increase our skills and capabilities around that. As leaders, we need to develop our skills in being able to manage uh, and engage a virtual team, uh, how you know, all the HR functions are associated with that through the onboarding process, uh, developing and sustaining culture, all of those things. How do we do that in a, in a virtual world? Um, things like cross-cultural competencies. Because we're in an increasingly interconnected, globalized world, um, 
you know, there's lots of talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging within organizations. Well, at the core of that, every single individual within an organization has to develop their cross-cultural competencies and their ability to work effectively with people from a wide variety of backgrounds, worldviews, and, and, and essentially just different ways of understanding and are interacting with the world. So that obviously includes things like race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, all of those types of kind of more overt outward uh, manifestations of diversity. But it also includes other things that may be a little bit below the surface that we can't see directly until we get to really get to know a person. The differences in, in uh, communication style, the cultural backgrounds, different political beliefs, different family dynamics, different organizational roles, uh, different levels of expertise, different socioeconomic status, uh, you know, all of these types of things that we can't easily see, but they represent cognitive diversity. They represent um, different ways of understanding the world. And so you could, you could have 10 guys like me who are all similar age, we're all white, men in the US, all similar age in their early 40s. And we may look like we're very similar. The reality is we all have a lot of differences. And some of those may not be readily apparent. But if I can't learn how to, to function effectively with people that come from a variety of different backgrounds, um, then I don't have much hope of being successful in creating an inclusive organization that really promotes a sense of belonging where everyone is fully engaged and has the potential to innovate and to contribute and to, and to help their organizations be successful. So that, that cross-cultural competence, I think, is also super, super essential. Uh, I mentioned new media ecologies. We also need to have new media literacy. Uh, so I, I kind of use the example of, of something like TikTok. Um, we, there are always these new platforms that come out. And the question is, do we learn how to utilize them personally in our careers, but also in business, in our organizations? And TikTok is one of those new platforms. It's been around for a couple of years now, um, but it, it is really a game changer. It has changed the way that individuals and organizations can get their message out and create a following because of the algorithms, um, the viral al algorithms within TikTok you can grow an audience for your brand so fast. Uh, and, and so we have to learn how to leverage these types of, of, of uh, new media. And that requires every single, not just our PR people, not just our marketing people, that requires every single employee and every leader to at least have a foundational understanding and competency around how to utilize uh, the media that's available to them. Um, you know, I, I can go on and on novel and adaptive thinking, sense making, uh, design mindset, and maybe I'll just end this part, this question with interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity. So I've already referred to increasingly complex, super structured organizations, messiness in the world around us, uncertainty, all of these things contribute to the really complex dynamic in the workplace we cannot be siloed. We can't, I can't, you know, I need specialization. I need on my team. I need people with very specific expertise and skills and specialization, but for an organization as a whole to be successful, we have to find connections across different functional areas and divisions of the organization. And we have to break down those barriers. We have to get out of our silos and we have to be able to work effectively with people from disparate parts of the organization. So that's referred to as transdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity. Uh, ultimately, we have to learn to better not only be experts in our specific areas, but also be generalists enough that we can speak effectively with and collaborate with people from extremely different backgrounds and different areas of expertise. So, I mean, that that's a, a handful of some of the types of competencies I think everyone is going to need in the future of work. Uh, we could get into more detail. We could talk about additional competencies. Uh, but if, if we're talking about kind of universal competencies that everyone is going to need, those are the types that I think of. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. So we obviously all live in so-called VUCA, VUCA world. We have a phrase VUCA world for <laughs> here in, in Slovenia. So uh, yes, uh, but uh, also we have uh, uh, in Slovenia a very, very common stereotype uh, about older people. It means, okay, older people will resist all changes. Uh, they cannot learn, uh, they don't want to learn anymore and so on and so on. So I really like to ask you, uh, of course, according to your experience, which approaches for developing skill and competencies work best for older employees? Yeah. So first, I think we need to debunk the stereotype, right? Um, because it, it's just not accurate. Now, mm -hmm. it's a stereotype for a reason, because it does hold true for some people. But I know younger people that don't like to change and to learn either. So okay. um, I, I think sure. I think really what we're talking about is infusing a learning culture into our organization and into our teams for everybody, regardless of their age, their gender, their race, their ethnicity, whatever, whatever category we may talk about. Now, specifically with age, um, in my experience, the stereotype doesn't hold true very well for most people. Now it does for some, but for most people, it doesn't. What, and rather what I see, it's, it's so it's not say old people, older uh, individuals um, not being willing to learn a new technology, for example, or a new process or a new system. But it, it is a matter of perhaps it taking them a little bit longer sometimes. Maybe they need a little bit more support. Uh, maybe they, they need a little bit more conversation about the why behind the change than maybe a younger employee who just kind of takes it in stride and says, oh, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. I don't, I don't see that as being unwilling to change. I, I just see that as um, a lifetime of experience where this individual, say this older individual, has seen a thousand changes in their career and across the organization. And they've seen a lot of them not work. And they, you know, and then so they, they've learned what works for them. They learn what works for their team. And now that now they're being asked to make this change. If I, as the leader in the organization, as part of the HR team or an executive or a, or a middle management role, if I don't know how to communicate effectively and articulate to people throughout the organization, the why behind what we're doing and how it's going to make their life better, how it's going to make their jobs easier, how it's going to improve things, if I can't communicate that effectively... Frankly, I deserve pushback. <laughs> so if I have uh, if I have senior employees who say, oh, I don't know, this doesn't seem to make sense, or I don't know why I'm expected to learn this new software, this other one we're using works just fine. If I can't communicate the why and help them understand why this is actually going to make them their lives better and easier, and it's going to streamline things and, and all that, if I can't do that effectively... I mean, that's on me. That's, <laughs> that's not on them. So I think a lot of times we, we use these stereotypes as a, a form of blame shifting mm -hmm. um, because we don't know how to do it effectively. I, I, to shift the narrative a little bit, mm -hmm. I also hear sometimes about, say, younger millennial or Gen Z workers. And you hear about the stereotypes about younger workers being entitled, um, you know, being uh, some, some fairly negative things. And I look at that it's and I also value. think, on, yeah. what, what's that? Uh, often they said they have no values, millennials. Right. And so we have these stereotypes. And, and is it true for some people? Sure. Sure. For some people. But it's, that's true for any age cohort, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I look at millennials, though, and, and some of these stereotypes that some leaders have towards them, um, I see blame shifting happening. I see a leader who doesn't know how to lead. Uh, because a lot, of, especially when we talk about um, entitlement or, or values alignment and values congruency with millennials in the organization, um, what I, I, it, it doesn't seem to me to be consistent with my experience. What I see, because I'm around millennials and Gen Z all the time, because I'm a university professor. I also do training and development work in organizations. I see it all the time. What I see are super motivated, um, highly adaptable and agile individuals who want to learn and grow and want to have opportunities to, to develop. 
And if, if a leader approaches them in that mindset and says, how am I going to coach and mentor and develop these people, give them opportunities for growth, um, and, and they support their younger employees to do that, more often than not, they're going to thrive. And, and they're going, those, those younger individuals are going to be happy, they're going to perform well, and it's going to be a win-win for everybody. But what, it, what ends up happening instead is a lot of sometimes older managers, they think, this wasn't what it was like for me when I was younger. When I started, you know, back years ago, I had to, you know, it was the it was the school of hard knocks, and I had to pay my dues. And I, you know, I had a crummy boss. And now these younger millennials, they're expecting all of this support and all of this coaching and mentoring and development. And they just need to, they just need to put in their time and pay their dues and not expect everything so early in their career. Um that kind of a mindset is, is a fixed mindset. That kind of a mindset is not a growth mindset. And ultimately, um, it, it's, it's, it's grounded in this mentality of, well, I did it, so now they're going to have to do it. So it, anyways, I, I just share that as another example. Whether we're talking about generational differences and the stereotypes around that, or we're talking about gender differences and the stereotypes around that, the first thing we need to do is break down the stereotypes because they're usually not particularly helpful or even true. Um, and so with older workers, you know, quote unquote, not being willing to learn, uh, I, I don't think that's true. I think they sometimes need more support. Sometimes they need more uh, understanding of the why behind the change. Um, but if we can do that, we can still help them to be successful. And then the reality is there's always going to be some people who really do resist. There's going to be some people who perhaps they just can't wrap their mind around the new technology or the new change. They can't get on board with it. And that's when you look for opportunities to transition them to other roles, other responsibilities, or perhaps even out of the organization. Okay, let's move on to some other, other uh, issues. So uh, we have now in Slovenia, uh, quite big HR issue. This is the labor market shortage. So we cannot find right. appropriate uh and qualified of course candidates for new positions let's say so uh what do you think it would make more sense for companies to carry out more frequent rotation retraining of existing employees implementing a mentoring system and so on so what is more efficient actually and what is more economic yeah the tight labor market is a reality all over the world <laughs> right now yes so what you're experiencing is certainly not unique to Slovenia. Um, and it, it is really, really hard. Organizations, there's so many positions that are going unfilled in organizations. That puts all sorts of strain on those organizations, on teams and on those leaders. Because yeah, you, you still have to do the work. You still have to staff the functions and get stuff done. And if you don't have the, the people, then what you end up having are more people picking up the slack. You have, you have fewer people picking up the slack, doing more work, and, and people are burning out. And that's part of the reason why people, it's a bit of a snowball effect. Now, that's part of the reason why people are increasingly leaving um, the, you know, what we have termed the great resignation uh, continues to snowball because people are realizing, I don't want to be in this org. You know, a lot of other people have already left. Um, now I'm getting stuck with all their work. I don't want to be in this environment. I have options because there's lots of positions. And so I'm going to try to go somewhere else. And then all of a sudden the organization has harder and harder time. So how do we, how do we deal with all of this? Uh, first and foremost, we, before we even get to the point of talking about um, job rotations and, and some of those sorts of things, we need to create a dynamic, psychologically safe and healthy workplace environment and culture, one that is attractive to people. Uh, hopefully we pay well with good benefits. You know, hopefully we have a living wage, we pay, you know, competitive wage and benefits. Um, so hopefully that's kind of a standard and that's off the table. And, and now we're just trying to get people to choose us over other organizations. Well, why are they going to do that? They're going to do that because we have a reputation for being a great place to work because people know that if they come to work for us, it's going to be a launch pad for the rest of their career. They know that they're going to have people that are committed to them, to develop them, that they're going to have the resources necessary to, to learn and grow and, and to be effective. 
Okay. So if we can create that kind of a dynamic culture and environment, it's going to help us attract higher quality uh, potential employees. And once we are able to grab some of them, it's going to help us retain them more. So that's, that's number one. If, and if we can't do that, if we can't attract and then have a, a healthy environment where we're able to retain those people, we're always going to be struggling. It's just going to be a hamster wheel and we're just a revolving door churn. Um, and we're always going to be struggling. Okay. But once, once you get good people in to the organization, then you also have to think about coverage and recognizing there's a, there's a whole variety of reasons why people leave or aren't able to come to work. You know, in, during the pandemic, we had periods of time where people had to, to quarantine, you know, for weeks. And so maybe they're not leaving the organization for another company, uh, but, but maybe they, they're sick. Maybe they, they have some sort of a, a medical condition. Uh, you know, right now in Eastern Europe, uh, there huge disruption in the Ukraine, of course. Uh, there, there's all these different things that can disrupt the ability for the human capital within an organization to do the work that needs to get done. So cross-training and job rotation is always a really important uh, approach uh, to to reskilling and upskilling members of our team. Does that mean you know if I'm in a in a team of say five or six people, and we each kind of have our different areas, our roles, our functions, and we have our expertise? Does that mean I'm going to become equally as proficient and expert in all those different areas of my team? If we if we do job rotations, no, that that, that won't happen, and that would be kind of a waste of resources if we tried to get everyone on the team to that point, but can I be functional and, and can I have an acceptable level of competency in key functions and areas within my team so that I can step in if someone can't make it to work for a particular reason, or we have to make do without a person while we're trying to fill a role with a new employee or something. Absolutely. I can do that. And if it's framed the right way, so I so I'm not just being told I have to do someone else's work, but I'm actually it's it's being um, given to me as an opportunity to learn new skills, to develop and prepare myself for future career opportunities. Uh, if we can frame it that way and provide the support necessary, it it actually can be a really tremendous um, way to re-engage employees that might even be burned out or might even be um, have become disengaged for a variety of fa or factors and a variety of reasons. Great. So uh, let me invite the audience if they have some questions, because we are very, very uh, <laughs> near to the end of this uh, presentation. Maybe some questions from the audience. I don't see any right now. Okay. Good. Then the, the final, let's say, um, point, uh, maybe your, your very, very short idea. Uh, how can we help people to uh, develop grow mindset? Each of us can do something for that, especially in the, in the companies, yes? And to become HR assistants, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. As I mentioned at the onset of our conversation today, we need to help every single leader within the organization from the lowest level supervisor all the way up to the C-suite and the senior executives and the CEO. We need to help every single person recognize that they perform HR functions and they have a role in the people management of the organization. Um, some naturally understand that, but many in my experience don't. And that's such a foreign idea to them. They, they just don't get it. They're, you know, they see themselves as an operations person or they see themselves as a marketing person or whatever. Um, and so we have to help shift the mindset and we have to help every leader recognize the people management functions that they do. Of course, HR can provide the support for them to learn and grow into those capabilities, but we need to shift that mindset. So that fundamentally requires a growth mindset. If I, as a leader, you know, I've, especially if I've been a leader of a team for a long time, or, or I'm a senior executive and I've been in the organization for a long time. Uh, it, it may be very, very challenging to get someone to take a new approach to how they perceive their, their role, their job, and, and their, their responsibility to develop their people. 
So we have to, we have to just be persistent with the messaging around, around growth mindset. You can provide trainings around growth mindset and perspectives to help people adopt those types of perspectives. But more than that, you just have to integrate it into the processes of the organization. Uh, you have to make it part of the performance management conversations. You have to make it part of ongoing coaching and mentoring conversations. As a leader, I need to be bringing it up and I need to be modeling it for my team continually. Like every time I interact with my team, I need to do it from a place of growth mindset and help them to recognize what I'm doing and how they should be, you know, ad adopting what I'm trying to model. Um, so there, there's no like quick, easy way to shift the way someone views the world and to shift the way someone thinks. But if we're consistent with it and with the messaging and with the expectations, then we can start to get there as an organization and as a team and as a leader. Mm -hmm. And to build finally, so let's say, well-being, organizational culture. <laughs> right. If I may add to do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, for sharing your uh, knowledge and experience with us. And uh, I hope uh, you will continue to research <laughs> HR, <laughs> HR work. We often say that uh, HR never ends and also leadership never ends, actually. It's that is true. Policy. That is true. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, contribution. Uh, now we will come to the, to the uh, summary of the conference. So I will switch to Slovenian again. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.